So welcome everyone and thank you for joining us um, today for this seminar on uh, the ethics of photography in international development with Martha Tedesse. This event is part of a wider series that I'm organizing with uh, my colleague Dr. Catherine Gresham who's here today and the series very much explores ethical issues in international development research and international development photography. My name is uh, Alice Chotard and I'm the Communications and Knowledge Exchange Manager for the REACH program at the University of Oxford. REACH is a research program looking at water security issues in East Africa and South Asia. And through my work at REACH, um, I really use photography, but I also work on personal photography projects on the side. And through these projects, I've very much come to question um question how i do my work and why i do this work and some of the questions have included for example uh, why am i the best person as a foreigner to do this work and how are my images contributing to wider narratives in international development that are useful or perhaps unhelpful or even harmful um sometimes we ask i mean we should ask people obviously um, if they're happy to have their photographs taken, but do they really understand how uh, the image will be used? And can we ever be sure that they are happy to have their photographs taken on? And importantly, can photography be used as a tool to empower people rather than um, take their, their dignity away? So, and this is applicable to uh, many of us. Uh, in the field of international development. We use uh, images in many different ways. We use, uh, we take photographs, uh, and whether we're professional photographers or use our phone cameras, but we also uh, sometimes commission photographers to take images or we buy um, some photographs online. So I hope this conversation will be um, informative, will be helpful, and please do share it if, if, you, if you find that it is helpful. Um, I've pre-recorded the conversation with Martha. It's about 40 minutes long and then we will have 20 minutes for questions. So please do pop in your question um, in the chat box and we will come back to them in the last 20 minutes of, um, of the session. Please mute yourselves and put your, make sure your camera is turned off. So without further ado now, I will introduce uh, Martha. Martha is a humanitarian um, freelance photographer based in Addis Ababa and she consults with various international and local NGOs. She was awarded the East African uh, Photo Prize, Photo Award in 2019 by the Uganda, Ugandan Press Photo. So without further ado, now here's our conversation. So hello, I am with Martha Tedesse here. Hello, Martha. And Hi. Hello. And Martha is going to share today her approach to photography and some uh, reflections on the ethics of photography. So to begin with, uh, Martha, I was wondering if you could start by talking to us about the kind of work that you do and your approach to photography. Thank you so much for having me, Alice. Um, I am based in Ethiopia, Addis Ababa. Um, I work with uh, local and international NGOs here in Ethiopia by traveling to different parts of the region, documenting different uh, development projects. Um, yeah, so I've been working since 2015 and let me just walk you through um, some of my work so I could... Um, yeah. Um, so most of my work, like I said, I exclusively work for NGOs. Um, so it's around health, uh, food security, child protection, um, harmful practices, emergency crisis at, uh, in different refugee camps around Ethiopia. Um, these are a few images that I just chose to kind of highlight. You can always go um, through my website, but um, yeah. Um, this is a picture on in um, one of uh, one of the uh, districts in Hosanna South. Um, it was for cataract campaign, um, 
And I love documenting pictures um, that kind of um, tackle the social norm or the gender role that we have um, here. And uh, most of the pictures that we're used to, even in development, pic development projects or development pictures, humanitarian photography, are uh, most of the health, ex health workers are male. Um, and I love kind of looking these different um, aspects, looking at gender, looking at age. Um, so yeah, I, I loved uh, documenting uh, Mascaram in uh, Hosanna. And here it's on uh, FGM assignment that I had in Somali region in Gode. Um, we're so used to having, you know, those sad images when you're talking about harmful practices. Uh, but looking at here, uh, it not only shows um, the joy of this community, but also coming together um, for a change. Um, it kind of shows communities taking part in being a change agent. And these women are um, coming together. This woman come together once in two weeks to get together, discuss about harmful practices from their own lived experiences in that region, and also dance around the neighborhood to kind of welcome other uh, mothers and women to uh, engage in conversation. So yeah, um, and these are pictures from um, hospitals that I uh, took a few years back. Um, and NGO pictures most of the time um, show women as um, beneficiaries, or should I say, we only try to show motherhood uh, when we're trying to portray poverty. Um, but I enjoy meeting um, young men and um, older men uh, taking responsibility um, or sharing responsibility of uh, parenthood. So I love this uh, picture on the right. Um, yeah, and this is a committee conversation in uh, Somali region. Um, these are from personal projects that I'm uh, working on. It's an ongoing project on Sufraj, um, the young woman here. There are a couple based in uh, Maxing. It's one of the um, towns in Gondar in the Northern Ethiopia. Um, yeah. Uh, I guess this is to say most of my work revolves around everyday lives of people from different economic um, status around Ethiopia. Yeah, thank you. Fantastic. These are uh, really beautiful, but also I think really set the stage for what we're going to be talking about. Um, before we kind of dive into more into your photography, I just wanted to ask you, because I think I think I read that you studied international development, didn't you? Yeah, uh, I did. Yeah. I'm wondering if you could share um, whether that has influenced your approach to photography. Um, definitely. I would say I have always loved photography first um, and storytelling, meeting people, traveling, but um, definitely having studied developmental studies have kind of shaped how I view my surrounding, my environment. And um, especially joining humanitarian photography, it did definitely help in shaping how I view uh, through my camera, how I write, uh, how I see poverty, how I see people or everyday lives. Um, yeah. Mm, thanks. And um, why do you think photography is such a a powerful and important tool in documenting international development and humanitarian issues? Yeah, um, well, I don't think, uh, I mean, photography is very powerful in challenging um, long held narratives. And when it comes to humanitarian photography or development projects, um, it does raise awareness in different uh, forms different social issues can be raised and addressed in uh, photography through storytelling. Um, and I think um, they help highlight situations, right? We want to, when we're talking about humanitarian or development projects, we want to kind of show the situation or conditions people are living through um, injustice or different social issues. So, um, 
photography does um, narrate those conditions as long as they're taken ethically and they do play a huge role in humanitarian photography. I don't think there is any other way for development projects to kind of show their work or their progress, their change in lives, other than photography, of course, videography, but to just say in general, the photography medium has been playing a great role in um, highlighting these uh, conditions. Mm, I, I, at the same time, I feel like photography can also reinforce um, or kind of create narratives that are counterproductive or, or harmful? Have you have you experienced that or do you have any thoughts about that? Um, definitely. I mean, um, I think um, the term poverty porn came from the humanitarian photography that has wrongly or unethically being used, right? So we do have um, different children with no names, no stories that we see in random um, local and international NGOs. Uh, and um, it does set a wrong narrative about certain communities just because those single narratives, right? I guess the limitations of photography is it's hard to kind of tell everything in just one frame, um, but we can always try to kind of balance um, these narratives. So it does um, play harmful representation or misrepresentation of uh, marginalized group, groups or um, the people that the, these organizations are trying to help. And I feel like looking through your photography, it's very clear that you're trying to challenge these norms. And I, you know, I really appreciate that your work on, on gender, on, on health, it's very focused on challenging these very norms. And um, thinking about your work on FGM, you know, it's how can we see things differently in a way that doesn't have to be, you know, aggressive, or I guess it can be, but kind of having that sort of nuance. Um, mm -hmm. You know, traditionally, a lot of the photographers who have taken images you know, of war or international development issues, so the humanitarian work, have been uh, men photographers from the West. And I wonder if you being a, an Ethiopian woman, whether that shapes your approach to taking images, whether that, you know, whether you take photos differently. Mm -hmm. um, right, um, so I'm a self-taught photographer. So everything I learned and still learning are of course online, right? So when I started photography, especially joining um, uh, humanitarian photography, I had to look for who are um, the people that are working on the ground, right? And I would say I haven't met, until recently, I haven't really found that many um, women um, humanitarian photographers. Um, so with all this um, discussions on, you know, uh, be it poverty porn, um, the white gaze and all these things, all of the white male gaze um, discourse, I had to learn in the long run. So I do, uh, I had to unlearn some of um, my own biases about certain community or the pictures that I used to take because I learned online and what I saw, which I thought was right or the right way. Um, so it did shape uh, when I started out, you know, I did make mistakes of um, either in consent, not asking people to have their consent or, um, you know, just pointing out my camera just because I have my camera. But in the long run, I'm still learning. Um, you learn from your mistakes, definitely. Yeah, and I, and I agree that we also learn from what we see. And if what we see is taken just by certain people, I mean, I, you know, I was also inspired a lot by National Geographic when I was a kid. And, and a lot of the images in National Geographic, you know, are problematic and they even acknowledge it uh, themselves. And exactly. so I think it's, it's really fantastic to have photographers like you and many others increasingly who can you know share their stories in different ways and through different eyes through different narratives so that's great how do you have any more thoughts on how we can maybe deconstruct those narratives or challenge those narratives through images i mean you, your work itself speaks to that but i wonder if you have any more any more thoughts about that mm -hmm. definitely i mean i think the first question is um what are our 
thoughts and what are our biases that we have been um, holding for the longest time, especially when we're talking about the Western media or the Western narrative. Um, what are what are my thoughts about the global south, for instance? How do I, we have been seeing those images, right? You know, um, starve appealing babies, babies with flies. Not that these um, children are not uh, there or in the community, of course it's part of it. Um, but in 2020, right? How do we decolonize? How do we deconstruct? the long held beliefs that we have. How do we learn? Do we go through the internet to also see and get updates? Who are taking photographs? What stories can I read? Um, I think asking these questions um, is very important. Um, knowing and acknowledging our privilege as we speak about certain places and certain countries that um, are far from where we are. So yeah, continuously questioning what we know, what we have known, are we um, able to unlearn? Are we able to acknowledge the mistakes that we've done through, be it our research narratives, be it our photographs? Um, yeah, uh, continuously asking ourselves, I guess, uh, I believe is uh, one way of starting. Mm, yes, very powerful, definitely asking, asking the right questions. Right, um, right. I wonder if you have any, inf any influences or, um, any photographers that uh, that really inf influenced you in your work? Mm -hmm. um, thankfully, there is access to internet and different photographers around the world are doing amazing work. Um, but my, I am always in awe of what um, Black women photographers around the world are creating, especially documentary photographers, both um, in Ethiopia, around Africa and the world. And um, I enjoy making my time to just see what other people are doing, what other women are creating. Um, and I'm always inspired and motivated by um, fellow photographers working on documentary um, projects, yeah. I wanna pick up now on something that you've said before. I think you used the term beautifying poverty. Um, and that links well with one of the questions I had. I mean, obviously, you know, as photographers, we're drawn into by the beauty of an image, the aesthetics of an image. And I wonder mm -hmm. if you could share your thoughts on, um, you know, how appropriate it is to, to really focus on the beauty of an image when we're documenting issues of poverty or suffering or vulnerability. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, I think... I mean, um, the first question would be, what beauty are we looking into, right? Because for some people, having a fly on the face to kind of portray poverty um, sounds like aesthetic, you know? It gives beauty or beautifying poverty. So I think um, the most important thing for us is um, acknowledging the power dynamics between the photographer and the people that we photograph. Um, I think the harmful, um, the harm starts there, where we set the angle. Um, you see there are a lot of um, NGO pictures when it comes to children eating. There's a top down or top bottom shots that people take, which is very problematic. Um, and uh, the angle that we choose, right? The light that we choose, um, the type of presets or anything that we um, pick, these every step of the way, and of course the captions, you have say 2000 characters to, to tell this story and how are you using it, you know? Is it, you know, the typical narrative, you know, the sunset, long, uh, long distance travel, this person has never eaten three times a day, all these um, typical stereotypical poverty captions are not gonna do justice to the situation. So, um, being conscious of, of all these steps that we take um, is important. Um, and it's funny because we don't, we don't really uh, make these captions. We don't really think of this specific angles when we're talking about the urban settings, uh, which clearly tells you that we are very biased on how we view um, other communities that are either marginalized or um, people with financial constraints, right? So um, 
yeah, we need to be conscious about every step of the way. How do I take this picture? Where is the, the right angle, the ethical angle? Um, are people willing to be photographed? And most importantly, how would I want to be photographed had I been in this situation? Would I be okay to have our, my, you know, flies all over my face to kind of tell poverty? Um, and when we bring it to um, our families, if I have a fly on my face, whoever is taking my picture would tell me, hey, shoo your fly, right? So why is it so difficult? We make it look like these flies are glued in this should even make time to kind of shoo their the flies. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. It, yeah. It, I'm glad you also mentioned uh, caption and text because, you mm. know, photographer's role is not just the image itself. The right. words that you accompany with the image with the images are also as you know as powerful, and you can reinforce stereotypes through words as well. Right. Right. Um, exactly. So picking up again on, on, you know, more question around representation, I think what strikes me and that comes up in what you've said, a lot of international development images um, kind of portray people as being passive, as being sort of victims. And that reinforces a narrative that they need to be rescued, you know, oftentimes by people from the West. And yeah. I wonder if you can, you know, share some thoughts on how we can add nuance to those narratives and how we can give agency um, and mm -hmm. give dignity to the people that we photograph. Yeah, um, thank you. Um, the first important thing I think is, are people comfortable? Because in some of the image you can clearly tell this person has been pressured to be in the frame, right? And um, one important thing I always say when it comes to photographing the people that these organizations support is just because you are supporting this community financially, uh, financially doesn't mean um, you have the right to take their pictures. It's okay if they say no, you know what I mean? You don't own this community. And even though it sounds, oh, but we support them, you know, and you really want to take their pictures, but they have agency to, they have an agency to say no, right? Um, so yeah, consent, um, are they comfortable? And what part of their stories do they want to tell us? You know, I do travel for say, if I have an assignment for FGM and this person doesn't really want to talk about FGM, rather ha her personal, um, survival of FGM practice. Uh, rather, she just might want to tell me about the community's practice. That should be fine. It doesn't have to be about her if that's not what she wants, you know? Um, yeah, and um, as much as we really want to focus on the issues, it's also important to narrate their hardworking side of stories as well. They don't always have to come as victims or survivors. Um, rather, what are their daily lives like? Um, we all share, regardless of our economic status, we all share feelings, we all share emotions. So um, what other feelings can we share in these photos? Does it have to be, they have to look sad, they have to be in deep thoughts of their, you know, they're thinking about their poverty or whatever, you know? Um, so, yeah, giving agency to the people that we photograph, um, giving dignity. They may not know about so much about photography, but they do know how they want to be photographed, you know? Um, so yeah, um, we have to focus and communicate with the people that we photograph, not with the technical aspects that we know of. I think this is um, important. Mm. Yeah, this is something that comes, that really shines through, I found especially in your personal project with the, the couple in Tigre. Um, you know, I mean, for people who haven't seen it, um, I'll just say that you've, you know, you've documented the kind of personal life of this couple, really challenging, um, you know, narrative that all of the women do, you know, all of the housework and you, you, you show this couple with a man getting involved and really personal relationship. And I think that kind of project really, you know, give, uh, give agency, they bring the humanity in people. And, and I think this is great. Um, this is also yeah. something that I've, you know, noticed taking photographs myself. 
um, in vulnerable contexts, I often feel, you know, um, attention when you come in, especially as a you know foreigner photographer. Right. There's this kind of attention because there's a power dynamic there. And there's a quote from um, Ecuadorian photographer uh, Felipe Jacome, and he says, "I'll just read." In many ways, photography is a violent act. We as photographers take pictures, we go in, shoot pictures and leave. And I think this is often very common in um, international development or humanitarian uh, assignments where people just you know, come in quickly, they interact very briefly and then they leave. And I wonder with you, like, how do you approach when you go in for an assignment, whether that's, um, you know, a commission or your own personal project, how do you, you know, allow time to interact with um, subjects that you take photos of? How do you, in a sense, um, you know, make sure that photography isn't a violent act, as uh, Felipe mentioned? Yeah, um, that's a beautiful quote, actually. Um, yeah, so speaking of the couple that you just mentioned in uh, Gondor, in the northern part of Ethiopia, um, I was sent there for an assignment. Uh, maybe people can see it. You can link it uh, to my website so they could have a sense of the project. Um, so I was actually sent for a project on um, newborn health, uh, newborn development, and I was very fascinated with the community, with the love, sisterhood that they shared at the hospital that ended up being my personal project. Um, and I've been documenting since 2018. Um, so how I communicate, the first thing is um, not taking your camera right away. Um, just starting conversation, telling where you come from, um, why you're there why you want to do what you're what you're going to do and um first and foremost right if they are willing to take part in this project the first no is a no there is no oh let me negotiate let me do this if a person says no they know they don't want to and that's it um and yes even for myself being even though i'm an ethiopian i'm in addis and even traveling around other parts of uh, ethiopia or different regions I have to acknowledge my own privilege because I don't speak their language. It's a different culture. Um, I'm coming with a camera and it's important for me to um, know these things in order to interact ethically with the community. Um, so it could mean knowing a word or two in their um, local language. It could mean understanding what and how they want these projects to take, um, taking time. When it's a short assignment, it's always a challenge, of course. Um, you're there for a short, could be half a day um, to document. But even then, um, it could be over coffee or tea, just interacting with the person that or the community that you're um, photographing to just have an actual conversation um, to kind of understand, not that you would understand everything, right, in that just short amount of time, but um, just making sure there is a communication and you're not just there to take pictures. Um, yeah, um, this is how I, um, whenever I travel, this is these are the things, um, trying to communicate, um, making sure I respect their culture and however they want to be photographed. And I think the challenge there is that a lot of um, assignments or even in, you know, in re when people take photographs through research, oftentimes these projects are, you know, very short in duration and that doesn't allow the ethical aspect of the photography. Right. So, you know, as much as, an, uh, as a recommendation for anyone who does photography, if you can push back and try to get more time, this is really essential for getting, you know, images that are, that are ethical. I wonder okay. if you have ever experience a situation where someone says um, yes to or to agreeing to to be taken um, uh, to be photographed but you know you, you sense or that they don't really necessarily mean it or, or they feel pressured maybe definitely yeah um, this happens when you have uh, supervisors from organizations that you travel with um, because they're there, um, they have a hard time saying no, you know, because they are being supported by this project. And this project is asking them to be a witness of 
whatever project they're taking in. Um, yeah, a lot of times actually, it happens a lot. Um, you can, they may not um, say they're not comfortable. They would tell you yes, but they don't engage as you photograph them. It could be um, not interacting in the conversation or having a very short answer to your um, questions. Um, and that's how, I mean, over time, of course, um, I understand, I, I came to understand how people um, say no without actually saying no. It could be them not, like I said, not being engaging, um, not being uh, participatory in conversations. And I would say, I wouldn't say, hey, um, this person doesn't want to take pictures, but I would rather say, oh, let me just get another person in the community. Let's just find another person because you don't want them to make, you don't want them to feel like um, they're not doing their job, even though there's, it's not their job to um, cover these stories, you know? Um, but yeah, it happens a lot. And I encourage photographers and researchers to always um, try to read facial expressions, um, continuously asking. It's not just one time question. When you're changing angle, when you're walking them to another place or to another frame, uh, just saying, are you comfortable? Do you really want to do this? You know, just keep asking um, the people that you photograph because the first yes might not be a yes at times. Mm, I find that sometimes yeah. when people ask you know how do you take good images oftentimes people expect sort of technical aspects technical answer but i think there's so much social skill in being a photographer in terms of reading people really reading a situation reading right. people's feelings and i think empathy really is the kind of a central value or, or central kind of emotion um another issue i've come across is um, getting people to understand how images are used and especially if it's you know poor rural communities that don't necessarily have access to internet how to explain you know how it's going to be used on social media etc I wonder how you navigate that mm -hmm. um, so with clients I always take uh, consent forms to I have consent forms in different languages. Um, so as I travel uh, it could be people that don't um, that are not able to read these consents, but I read them out loud or have a translator read them out loud. Um, you're right, it's very difficult to explain um, where the pictures are uh, being taken, but um, you know, the, in, in health posts or in health centers, they do see these uh, banners with uh, visibility signs. Um, you start from there, it could be like this, but it's not physical, you know what I mean? Um, to just say they might not understand internet. So you tell them it's going to be visible like this, just on the internet, or your pictures will be seen worldwide. It's not just here or for the office. A lot of people will see it. It may be if it's for print, it may be for annual reports. And um, I don't, I haven't had an experience where it's so hard to understand. I don't know. It, it has been easier to explain, but I think it's also because um, there are these annual report booklets where people could see it might be you in this, you know, in this type of document. So if they agree, then um, uh, we proceed with the projects. Yeah. Okay. And now moving on. Um, so we've talked a lot about you know, photographer taking photographs, but now I'm thinking about people who, you know, might commission images or who might use images. I wonder if you have any recommendation about how, you know, how using certain images might contribute to those narratives and how they can, you know, improve their practices through using and commissioning images. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I would say having a brief and debrief always with the photographers, um, whoever is being out on the field to document. Um, the communication team, the communications team has to always be open to learning. Say if it's an international client hiring me to document um, a community where this communications person has never been to, I would appreciate um, an active listening to my recommendations of the type of image they should be expecting. You know what I mean? 
Um, Cause I've come across um, clients who would expect these stereotypical, you know, um, inmates and you bring a different type of image. And I have been in argument in different times with different clients trying to explain, well, you don't want to um, take these pictures this way because you are contributing to this stereotypical narrative of um, humanitarian photography. And I mean, I would say in development photography or humanitarian photography has definitely shifted from uh, victimhood imagery to um, successful image. I think it's wise for NGOs to know they rather want to show what they have succeeded in that particular community by providing whatever projects or whatever um, strategies that they have created in that area, rather than just showing a crying baby or um, this, you know, poverty porn image that just says nothing about the NGO's work. Okay, this client wants to show a, a picture of a child with a fly or a starving baby, you know, all these images. What are you trying to tell the world? What are you trying to tell the donors? What are your parts? How are you trying to change that? You rather want to show how you have changed in the long run in the process. Change, you know, it's it's relative, not to mean flies will be away or you know what I mean? But um, it's important to show hardworking communities or their everyday life than um, just staging those, you know, under the sunset, under the tree, looking sad, looking for, you know, all that, those images. Um, so yeah, um, definitely take trainings if you have to, if you're a communications person working in developmental uh, development projects, international NGOs, um, try to be open to learning um, these new terms that are coming in discussions, you know, um, and being open to taking critics about your work, about um, the type of image that you are expecting. And most importantly, trying try to listen to, if we're talking about international NGOs, try to listen to the locals. There is no way you would know. However, uh, whatever expertise you may have, there's no way you could tell me that um, you know better than my own community. And I think that's that's very um, crucial in the process. Hmm, great. And um, have you ever refused to do some assignments? Oh, definitely. <laughs> um, it's a privilege, I must say. I, I work as a freelance, so I have the power to decline. I'm not a full-time, I'm not working for anyone. Um, so yeah, um, I have declined projects where NGOs wanted to stage an event that did not happen. I have had that experience. And of course, these um, images of insensitive images around uh, women's health, SRHR, you know, expecting um, could be to be inside the procedure where women are having their um, these uh, medical procedures. And similar, yeah, definitely. And um, sadly, um, even though I refuse, I'm sure they have found someone that's that could work. And that's the issue, like having, not being open to discussions of why they shouldn't document these pictures or why they shouldn't do or how they should do better. Um, so how we can change is not me declining doesn't change or doesn't uplift anything. Rather, I wish I could say I have challenged this NGO for this, 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 and I managed to work for them in a different perspective, you know? Um, I think that would be a successful story, but yeah, definitely. I have had quite interesting arguments with different clients. And I feel like you've already responded to this question, um, but if you could very succinctly, if you had, you know, three top recommendations for anyone interested in taking images in, in international development, what, what would they be sort of quickly, briefly? Yeah, um, consent, ethics, and dignity. These are, I think, the most important things. Ask, 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 ask the photographers, ask yourselves. I think you'll be great through that. Be humble as well, right? Yep, yep. 
definitely. And just yeah. my final question, is there anything that makes you hopeful that the ethics of photography are sort of, you know, becoming more prominent now? Yeah, I really value this conversation. What we just, what we are just having, um, what, what I am, sorry, what I am having with you as well. Um, more conversations need to happen. More, um, more, most importantly, I wish NGOs have some sort of conference to actually talk about this humanitarian photography. You know what I mean? Because every NGO is working in photography. Every NGO is using photography and videography for their reports for, I mean, everything, right? So I wish they put enough effort um, to have these conversations because most of this conversation happened, most of these conversations happen between like-minded people. Um, we just motivate and inspire each other, but I wish we could challenge the system that's just up there um, looking untouchable. <laughs> but I'm very hopeful um, that we can change through conversation, um, being outspoken, challenging um, one another, yeah. I like to end on a hopeful note, so that's good. And I think that's something that's easily, that's an easy takeaway for people, you know, just go have conversations right. about this. Right, uh, right. Go we'll have conversations and, and go challenge people. And also I right. think a lot of people, whether, you know, even if they're not photographers themselves, now everyone carries a, you know, phone camera with them and goes around exactly. and takes images. And I think a lot of these recommendations are very valuable to anyone who's not necessarily a photographer. True, true, yeah, yeah. All right. Thank you so much, Martha. This is all we have time for. But thank, thank you, you very much. It's constant. So whether I am staying there for a while or a, sh a very short time, I rather ask consent, get the consent and try to wait for the moment. Or there are, I must be honest, that there are moments I take pictures because I don't want to miss the moment and ask for their consent afterwards. Um, if they say no, right away, the photo is deleted. Um, but yeah, I rather wait for the moment after getting their consent for most of, most of the time. Thanks, Martha. Um, another question revolves around um, expectations from images. So the, I think it is a question from uh, Denise. Um, she's asking about, you know, people asking for money, but that can also uh, relate to expected immediate benefits from the photography. Sometimes, you know, the, 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 the impacts will be felt, you know, much later or, or, or not immediately on the people that are photographed. How do you navigate those expectations? Mm -hmm. um, well, as I work for NGOs, there are no immediate fees for their pictures and um, I don't, I have never personally paid um, someone to be photographed. As long as they're willing to tell their stories, I just photograph them. And for my personal projects, how I, um, I like engaging the community or the people I photograph, I want to share a, a screenshot. Um, A screen share. I think Alice, you have to. We have to make you a yeah. call. So let me do that right now. Um, I think Catherine, can you do that as the host? I can't make Martha. I've just done it. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, hold up. Let me just. Hold. Mm. Okay, um, so with the with my personal uh, project, I spend a lot of time with the community. Um, this project, um, Alice earlier mentioned, you can find it on my website. I, um, I have been working since 2018 and giving back to the community would mean um, actually showing the community what I have been documenting or what kind of stories I have been telling or um, how I have been telling their stories um, through my, my audience. So this was an exhibition I did in the community. Um, the community that took part in, the, in these photographs were um, able to view um, these stories as well. So I enjoy um, showing the communities, giving back the print um, and 
um, give, like having a discussion where these photos are going and it has been really rewarding to see the community um, enjoy their own stories in their own community. So that's one way of doing it. I don't think, well, I have to say, when you travel to the Omo uh, Valley South region um, in Ethiopia, you cannot take pictures um, without paying um, individuals. So I, I have traveled there as a tourist, not as a photographer. Um, I have visited um, the community and I did uh, pay for the pictures that I took, but sadly I didn't get the time to get names and their stories. So over time I had to learn to take down from my website and Instagram. Um, I plan to travel there and redo these stories, but yeah, that's one of my experiences. Thanks, Martha. Um, we now have a question on risks to uh, the people that are being photographed. Can you talk a little bit about the potential risks uh, for participants of having their images taken and how do you explain those risks? Mm -hmm. um, so it could be, I think it's also about privacy, right? When we're talking, when we're documenting um, very private, um, very personal, sorry, very personal stories, um, we don't want the we don't want people um, we don't want them to be exposed if they're not willing. Say when we're talking about health related issues, it could be um, a person talking about their um, uh, a person living with HIV AIDS and other um, I don't know I can't think of anything at the moment. It could be say FGM, if the person doesn't want to be photographed, there's always a way um, to not portray or to not do a close-up shot. Um, you can always document from their behind um, or some artifacts that um, they want to share as they um, share conversation. The other thing I could think of other than health is in emergency cases, say um, refugee stories. Refugee stories are politically very, um, um, private and personal. So those are things to always consider. Does this person really want to be open? Even though they often are okay to be photographed, um, over time we have to learn through the interviews that we provide, um, we should be able to think and say, oh, I shouldn't, you know, I shouldn't document you this way because this is a very personal story. Yeah. Thanks. We now have a couple questions on organizations commissioning images. So one from Andrew. I wonder how much pressure is applied by picture editors looking for those shocking images of flies on faces. Does working for the NGOs negate that? Mm -hmm. um, are they now looking for more positive images or change happening? Or do they also ask for the more shocking stereotypical white gaze imagery? Or are they mm -hmm. looking for something new? So yeah, asking about a change mm -hmm. in how photos are commissioned. Right, right. Um, the humanitarian photography world definitely has changed over the years. Um, I would say it has, at least speaking from my clients, it has definitely shifted from victimhood and stereotypical narrative to successful stories and everyday lives of people. Um, but yes, um, it saves us a lot from having a pressure as humanitarian photographers. Um, even though clients do send expected um, delivery emails, um, I have the freedom to also comment and reflect uh, with my clients. But for the permanent contracts that I have as a freelance, um, I have the full right to uh, be as creative as possible. And I haven't been pressured into, hey, we're expecting these type of inmates. Um, I have been working for um, UNICEF Ethiopia for five years now. So we do have brief, but it's more about the situation and what I should expect rather than um, the deliverables. Yeah. And in terms of... Um there's a question from Hadley. Um, how many of the NGOs uphold consistent ethical and rigorous processes for obtaining informed con consent? So specifically looking at consent for photography. Is this something that is valued by NGOs consistently in this sector? 
Um, yeah, I mean, I again, uh, this is clearly uh, from experience with the clients that I've worked with. So this may not apply for every NGO out there. Um, but yeah, I spoke earlier that I have declined certain projects or certain clients uh, because of unethical uh, image. I go through their website to see what's been going on, how they have been telling these stories, not only photographs, but how um, their annual reports look like. So, um, yeah, um, it is coming, it's better, uh, but it could be much better as well. So now um, an interesting question about um, intellectual property and copyrights. Um, and how that could also be opened up to the communities and people photographed. Could this uh, way to rethink about copyrights also a new way to change the power dynamics between the photographer and the people documented? I wonder if there is any attempts, experiments in this regard around copyrights. If not, what are the challenges? That's actually an excellent um, input. I have no idea if there has ever been an attempt uh, but it's definitely something NGOs could look into. Um, copyrights is an issue not only for the uh, people that we photograph. We as photographers uh, don't hold uh, most, of, most of the time clients take the copyrights. So that's also an issue. But definitely um, it would be great to see how that could develop within the community as well. And that sort of links up to um, another question on participatory photography. I think there are links between the two questions. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, whether you've tried participatory photography, this question from Andrew, I realize this might be doable in short time. This might not be doable in short time, but working with community writing captions or taking pictures themselves with guidance from, from her, how would NGOs be funding the extra time needed? Mm -hmm. um, that's actually um, something I really enjoy, participatory photography. I have curated one project with uh, European Union um, 2018 or 2017, sorry. Um, so what we did was we gave out um, uh, we gave out trainings on photography, storytelling. We had uh, women come from different regions of Ethiopia here at this for the training. Um, so we talked about intersectionality, um, documenting their everyday life, and of course, basic uh, uh, techniques to photography. And the turnout was really, really impressive. Um, we had an exhibition for, um, for the community. They were really impressed with what they have created. So it was really um, a great way to also raise awareness on intersectionality. It was on how, um, how to tell women's stories in different regions. Um, again, that was tackling the stereotypes, uh, typical image uh, within Ethiopia that always documents women either as um, motherhood, mothers with a lot of children or a lot of yellow jerricans when it comes to development projects. So um, I have done that and currently working on Safrash story. I have left a point and shoot camera and I'm looking forward to um, receiving their photographs as they document their everyday life out there. Um, yeah, I, I, I do value participatory photography and I've been um, trying to grow that type of uh, medium as well. And do you think photography, participatory photography opens up new and different ethical questions? Hmm. So I'm, uh, I'm thinking in particular, if you know, if you, for example, if through the stories that people come back with, there's, um, you know, stories of distress that, you know, you feel like you should do something about or, Mm -hmm. Right. Um, I mean, trainings are important, right? Uh, so that's when you are giving a camera to the community um, without a training, you definitely should expect the stereotypical image that you have been seeing because that's exactly what they've been seeing in different medias, right? So there should always be a discussion and training on ethical imagery and storytelling. So definitely there might be unethical issues, but it comes from 
not knowing um, the discourse of ethical imagery. Thanks. To say not being reluctant, that's what I want to say. Yeah. Um, question from Maria. Uh, besides acknowledging power dynamics and privilege, what concrete actions in photo taking process in the photo taking process can be acts of justice? Which steps, mm -hmm. processes, concrete things can we do to decolonize the gaze? I feel mm -hmm. partly the participatory photography is, you know, might be one one answer to that question, but you, yeah. Right. Yeah, um, I guess we can't always do participatory photography, especially when we're talking about a short term assignment. But I personally believe in relationships. I think relationships uh, build a lot of trust, a lot of some type of uh, friendship that you have with the person that you photograph. So um, it's always different when you're there you shoot and you interview these people and you just leave uh, versus you taking time, it could be to have coffee or take time to also um, share part of your story as you are expecting them to share their stories. So kind of having a mutual um, conversation and a two-way conversation that, um, that definitely um, changes and adds beauty to your relationship uh, with the person you photograph. I think that's, that's something we can think of, yeah. Thank you, and a question from Josh now. Um, he's asking about the difference between photography stills and video, whether there are similar ethical issues or whether there's different um, ethical issues. Hmm. Um, I mean, they both are, um, we're talking about image and, image and motion and image and still. Um, there will always be an issue of um, ethics whenever we put someone to be photographed or videographed. Um, so, I mean, the, the, the basics, constant, are they willing, are they okay to be photographed? And with still, when we're talking about motion image, um, unlike photography, you, you are in a motion, so you'll have to be very considerate and, um, and take time to kind of see which angle you're picking, right? Um, I could, I could just skip a frame and say, no, I'm not gonna photograph that. Once you're in a video, um, those are things you really want to um, consider as you are videographing. Are people comfortable? Are they sharing what they want to? Um, are I invading their privacy as I just, you know, uh, pull up my video um, camera and point it? So I think it goes back to, are people comfortable? Are they okay to be in this? Um, that's, that's what matters mm. as we uh, document people. I feel that with uh, still photography, it's, it's, it's a fixed image mm -hmm. um, that you see. I mean, you can see it part of a longer photography essay, right. uh, but with film, it allows for, you know, maybe building a, a wider narrative at the same time. Right. The videographer will edit the the video so there's lots of room for you know curating a, a narrative curating a story so i think some of the issues are similar but there there's also some some that are distinct true true um i realize that uh, we're at the hour now so if you have to go that's that's fine how do you feel, Martha, about staying a few more minutes to take a few more questions? Yeah, definitely. Um, there are good questions, and thank you for helping me reflect more. <laughs> yes, they're great questions. Um, and I realize we also have you know, a short amount of time. I think the, each question would require a full day to answer. Um, yeah. Question from Lucy. Um, I'd like to hear more about how you think you're... Um, how you think your identity influence your gaze. As you say, you're privileged and an outsider. Uh, sorry. As you say, you're privileged and an outsider. Are we implying that non-white photographers are better positioned to undertake photography ethically? Mm, <laughs> that's a tricky question. Um, I, 
I don't think it's about, like I said, I have to, I myself as a non-white person have to learn about ethics, right? However, I think I know my country. Um, there's always uh, a difference in culture when you're traveling um, from where I am. I am based in the capital city and I have to learn a lot about um, other people's culture. Um, and as I travel, people are different everywhere, right? So I think the question, should be, um, can we be um, ethical, uh, one, and two, the difference between me traveling from Addis, um, yes, I have the privilege, I could be an outsider for that community, even though we share the same nationality, um, but when it comes to um, a Western photographer traveling to part of the region, I think that's another uh, privilege. Not only the person is from a different country, we're talking about um, the white supremacist system that's out there that gives the privilege, right? So we have to acknowledge our layers of privilege, uh, privilege as we travel to places. So I don't think um, just because I'm black, it guarantees me ethics. I don't think just because a person is white, that person doesn't know ethics. It's more about are people willing to unlearn and are people willing to acknowledge their privilege? Yeah. Great, there was a similar question from Valentina, but I think, um, I think you've pretty much answered it. So similarly, again, on the gaze and representation, there's a question from uh, Emanuele, um, specifically, asking about whether there's such conversations unfolding within Ethiopia. So which are the mainstream Ethiopian gazes on development and which um, are the alternatives, new ones? Huh, um, the conversation is not happening within Ethiopia. Sadly, there. that's a very good question actually. And sadly, most of the NGOs that are based in Ethiopia do fly in Western photographers. So not so many of the angels actually know that we exist. Um, so the conversation is yet to happen and hoping um, they are open to these types of conversations. Thank you. Um, a question about how you navigate and communicate with your clients if you're not satisfied with the outcome of the job. For example, if um, the photos don't meet your standards, I imagine this is coming from her perspective, situation where you didn't get consent or didn't have enough time to make everyone feel comfortable with the process. Mm -hmm. um, like I said, um, consent is very important and I make sure I get the consent. And again, to be honest, I have missed consents when it's a lot of people that I have to photograph. It has, there has been time I have missed consent and I had to delete the photos when I get back. Um, so within, with the clients, like I said, um, I can always say no when I, have, when I don't feel comfortable documenting. Um, there are certain rules, right, for everybody. And I don't really enjoy um, a very stubborn TOR that goes, this person has to wear this and be at this, this time and this. I'm like, no, we're talking about photography. And this person that you are mentioning has to be comfortable to be in that position. So um, yeah. A lot of back and forth with organizations and NGOs. Um, sometimes it comes out nicely, sometimes we part ways. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. And that's part of um, you know, pushing for change as well, navigating right. and right. hopefully over time, you know, convincing the, the commissioning agencies. Yeah. Okay. yeah. I think we're going to leave it at that. Um, but thank you so much, Martha, for uh, pre recording the session and for joining us today. I realized. <laughs> There were a lot of questions and we were going quite quickly. So I appreciate you. Thank you everyone for joining in for your amazing questions. Thank you so much. Thank you, Alice. For, yeah, yeah or, yes. fantastic to have you. And um, I think someone asked for your email. 
if I'm well, correct, um, people can contact you through your website. Mm -hmm. I could drop it you want here. To, yeah, share, share your uh, website on in the chat. And okay. in the meantime, um, I will just say that the session was recorded um, and that we will release it as a podcast in um, 2021, January or February. Uh, it won't be the full session. It will be edited. Um, but if you're interested in the full session, just email me. And we will be running, as I mentioned at the start, we will be continuing our seminar series on the ethics of international development and international development photography and research in 2021. So do sign up. Um, I think Catherine shared my email earlier on. Um, sign up to the series or just take my email to get access to the recording. Uh, thank you everyone for joining and a special thank you to Martha. It was fantastic. Thank you, thank you so much. And your views and uh, wishing you all a wonderful time, everyone. Yes. Bye-bye. Take care.